Hello, and welcome to Mornings with Joel, commercial real estate podcast, where we focus on rising stars and established players in commercial real estate and talk to them about how they are building legacies in today's marketplace. This is the Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. Uh, we're very excited to have a very special guest with us here today, Jay Bailey. And uh, Jay, how you doing? How's it been going? Man, I couldn't be better. Best day of my life, man. Welcome or good morning to everybody on the call. Joel, glad to be here, my brother. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. <clears throat> you know, Jay, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, your name came back up when I was uh, talking to Jerome Russell the other day. And um, I went to, to put your name in my phone and I was like, how's your name already in here? So oh, very cool. we, we've crossed paths before mm-hmm. uh, at some point, somewhere in time. And uh, I don't know exactly what it was all about, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly uh, dive into that a little bit. First of all, I want to congratulate you. You've had some uh, recent really good success, president of the Rice Center. And if I'm not mistaken, I ran across you in this little magazine here as well. Oh, yeah, brother. I was in the back for the, the, custod- the custodial part. Yeah, in the yeah, back exactly. there. Exactly. One of the top 500 most influential Atlantans. So, my man, doing your thing. Congratulations on that. Thank you, sir. That's it. You give us something to shoot for. How about that? Brother, don't aim too low, man. And don't go back. <laughs> Absolutely. So, let's do this, um, if you don't mind. Uh, let's just go into a, a little bit about your background because the question is always, you know, how did you get to where you are. How did all this start for you? You know, you've ended up at a very important place and um, obviously you've got a tremendous track record. So how did it, how did it all begin? You don't have to go from cradle to grave, but you know, you know, a you know well, brother, it is all connected. Entrepreneurship has always been a common thread in my life. I was the kid that used to make popsicles in the ice tray, sell them for a dime in my driveway. I was so cold with it y'all that I used to, I used to literally charge people 50 cents to fight in my backyard so they wouldn't get caught in the front yard. I was always this kind of hustler, brother. I started my first business at 12. I bought my first house at 19. I made my first million by the time I was 23 years old. But I didn't have good money role models. I didn't have a community around me. I didn't really understand the language of money. So I literally went from living in a 10,000 square foot home to living in a nine by nine storage unit on Mountain Industrial Boulevard in Tucker, Georgia. By the time I was 28. Three years after that, I really realized by the world standards, I had all the cars, the clothes, the houses, by the world standards, I had been successful, Mm -hmm. but I had zero significance and I had done nothing to put a dent in this world. So I really started choosing that path of significance. Three and a half years later, I'm running a $30 million nonprofit organization in 10 countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, I retired at the age of 39, Uh, made my wife a very strong promise that I never get another job again. I thought self-determination was paid by the road to entrepreneurship and owning your own business. Right. Uh, we started a private foundation. I got into a logistics company, but I had to break that promise to my wife because there are very few times in life you get to be a part of something you know will outlast you. And there are even rarer moments in life where you get to be a part of something that could potentially change the course of history. And I know we'll get into it, but the opportunity that we have at the H.J. Russell Innovation Center for Entrepreneurs is unlike anything else I've seen in the country. And especially if we're focusing on Black entrepreneurs in a space that was designed to undergird deep belonging, be focused on access, opportunity, and exposure, we're poised to make some history. So I had to break that promise to my wife and I find myself here. The story goes a little deeper in some areas, yes, but uh, it's been a it's been a story of ups and downs for sure over these many years. Okay, all right. Now that's very interesting, and um, you know, like you said, congrats on that success. But you mentioned a very very important point that unless you have mentorship and unless you have people around you that understand money, it will go just as fast as it comes in. You know, so you've got to understand it. You've got to put it together. So that's that's worked out really well. From that standpoint, I mentioned also that uh, some of the other things you're, you're doing right now, because I definitely want to go back to Rice. I want to talk about that a good bit today. But you've also done some work with the uh, Phoenix Leadership Foundation and also with Greenwood Archer. Uh, what's mm-hmm. going on with that? Well, I mean, Phoenix Leadership Foundation, my wife and I, we have a private foundation that has a one word mission statement. It's exposure. 
I think the greatest contributing factor to poverty or a poverty mindset is lack of exposure. So what can we do to take our blessings, our resources and pour them back into community to expose young men and now even young women to opportunities that they may never have dreamed? I think education means very little without aspiration. And aspiration ain't even really possible if you're not exposed to things. Right. But Greenwood Archer, you know, my wife's from native Oklahoman. I was inspired by the Tulsa, Oklahoma story and have traveled there multiple times and met many of the city officials and leaders. It's literally, you know, our space, a small fund that we created to invest back into communities, to build communities, to acquire properties, but then to teach others. Mm-hmm. And so these are two pa- passion product projects that we keep and will continue to keep that are legacy projects for sure. Yeah, yeah, very good point. You know, you mentioned about um, the exposure. The whole idea behind exposure, obviously, is giving ones the opportunity to see what's possible, you know. And it was amazing because I've actually been out there in Tulsa as well to, uh, you know, Greenwood and Archer. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing thought. And if you think of all the history that took place right there on that, that corner, if you will, it's quite amazing. So to be able to try to expand on that and grow that is, is quite impressive. So we certainly, certainly appreciate that. Let's dive a little bit deeper into, uh, into rice. You made mention of breaking the cycle and how, you know, exposure is important. What are some things that you would say specifically rice is doing that's unique, that's really helping entrepreneurship uh, in this uh, area, in this space? Well, I mean, it, you know, if I could take some rice, it's hard to talk about our work without educating and always speaking about the man. Uh, H.J. Russell Sr. was one of the most prolific entrepreneurs this city ever produced. This is the guy that built half of our skyline, integrated the Chamber of Commerce at the city and the state level. Brother had a pool inside his house at 33, uh, (laughs) where young Dr. King used to go and swim and try to figure out how he wanted to change the world as Mr. Russell was helping to underwrite the entire civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in Atlanta, although we're the cradle of the civil rights movement, we only had one huge kind of dust up, and that was the student movement. Uh, If you ever come down to the Russell Center across Northside Drive, Fair Street becomes Student Movement Boulevard in honor of Mr. Russell. Uh, 117 students got locked up under that that protest. Mr. Russell, one man, bailed them all out. And if you want to give some context to the building where you're in the physical space, you got to say that you got to think about it. A black man with a severe speech impediment over 78 years ago. Uh At a time where they were still lynching brothers in the state of Georgia, having the audacity to build a headquarter building that is a full city block wide and 50,000 square feet. He built it intentionally on a hill directly across the street from Spelman, Morehouse, Clark, Atlanta, Morris Brown, because at that time you couldn't go to the University of Georgia or Georgia Tech or Georgia State, Emory. So as these students would matriculate from all over the world to go to the best colleges for Black people, he knew that they needed to see the physical manifestation of what was possible for people that looked like them. Mm -hmm. And so he built his headquarter building there with his name on it, H.J. Russell and Company. So Part of what we're trying to do is take this now 54,000 square foot structure, the largest center in the world dedicated to growing, scaling and developing black businesses and creating the space of deep belonging. Diversity and inclusion is one kind of thing that's kind of a buzzword now, but you got to you know, create a deep sense of belonging. And we wanted to blow up the, you know, the typical incubator or accelerator model. Most programs are only focused on being informational. Our job is to really be transformational. How can we provide a full experience to the whole entrepreneur? We can't ignore the anxiety, the depression, the loneliness, the self-esteem, the self-confidence, belief it takes to win. I know that we lose GDP every year because the brilliant ideas that reside on the south side of tracks and here south of I-20 never reach the marketplace because they don't believe they belong. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly know that the only difference between Bankhead and Buckhead is access, opportunity, exposure. And how can I live at the nexus of access, opportunity, exposure, bring the best corporations, the best companies, the best business leaders, the best thinking, the best role models, the best community together under one roof to make sure that our entrepreneurs and small businesses have access to everything they need. I'm only in two businesses. I'm in the readiness business and I'm in the access business. Our job is to continue to create the platform that will help get businesses to a point of readiness, whatever that means for them. And once they're at a point of readiness, being able to give them the access they need to fly, creating a safe space for our companies to fail and fly where they can be vulnerable enough to learn and doing all of this, really stealing the HBCU model, brother. If I ask if we have any Morehouse or Spelman folks on this call, 
as much as you paid for your education, spending 98% of your time in the classroom, 200 plus thousand dollars on an education, four to five years matriculating. And if I ask you to speak for 10 minutes about your experience at Morehouse or Spelman, you're not going to bring up a single class you took. It wasn't just about the curriculum or the coursework. It was about the community, the culture, the covenant of what it meant to be a Morehouse man, a Spelman woman, or Georgia Bulldog, a Hampton Pirate, doesn't matter. It's the culture, the community, the covenant that actually is the thing that is transformative. You wrap that around a world-class curriculum, world-class instructors, world-class partners on a continuum of engagement, not just in episodic pieces of six weeks or 10 weeks or 12 months, because if we're successful, if a company goes from 100,000 to a million in revenue, a million in revenue to 10 million in revenue, they have different needs along that continuum and we want to be able to support them. So our model is big ideas, inspire, develop, execute, accelerate, scale. Mm -hmm. It takes a business along a continuum, but it's a circle. Even when a business gets to the point of doing 50 million in revenue, you've got to continually go back to that ideation phase to reimagine how you connect with your customer. So this continuum and this pen that we have, we're starting to see results already. We have at least seven companies that we have under our wheelhouse that are doing north of $20 million in revenue. Uh, mm. We retain 98% of our 127 entrepreneurs through the pandemic. And we're just bringing on an additional 60 entrepreneurs this April with a goal of reaching and having full-time 1,000 entrepreneurs in our Big Ideas platform in five years. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive, exactly. So is this just for, for real estate? And, no, uh, no, no, no. Russell, okay. And I know the, the answer. Russell, the I Russell, want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, the Russell family is 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 where they were they were gracious enough to give us the building as a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not a part of H.J. Russell and Company, the for-profit company. Mm -hmm. Jerome happens to be the chairman of our board, but we're a separate entity. Mm -hmm. in and in fact, we raised a little bit of north of $34 million in the past two and a half years from the philanthropic, from the corporate community to run our operations, to build out the center. Uh, it's a $50 million project in total. Uh -huh. We have a goal of raising an additional 20 million this, this year, but we're industry agnostic. And so for that reason, we're big into collaboration. We can make sure that we set the platform, but I'm a firm believer that experts should teach further future experts. Uh -huh. So yes, if we have a company that's in the real estate space, we can make sure that they're connected to the H.J. Russell and companies, the holder construction guys, the people that we have deep relationships with so they can get mentorship, mm -hmm. learning, counsel, exposure to the best in the world. If you're a fintech company, I've got FIS, I've got WorldPay, I've got, I got Fiserv. You know, if you're a product company, I've got Target and Walmart and Amazon and Shopify and PayPal at the executive level, making sure that you have all the right access to the best information, the best relationships, and the best platform to grow your business. So kind of like a Harvard model where they bring the best professors in from the world that are actually doing the work, not just teaching and talking about it, but they're actually practitioners in the world moving the needle. I want to bring that same concept to the Russell Center where our entrepreneurs have access and are learning from the best in the world. Okay. Okay. So that sounds really good. A person wants to get involved in that. So if someone does want to get involved in that, what would actually be the be the procedure? You know, we, we, we require every one of our stakeholder companies to go through an info session. It's kind of just like the college model where, yeah, you got to go test it out, go do a tour, go do a visit, see if it's for you, if there's a good fit. From there, someone would apply. You cannot apply without attending an uh, info session. But once you attend an info session, you submit the application and it's pretty extensive because we we measure a lot of data points and we want to be very deeply engaged with our entrepreneurs. I think it's a 75 question application. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we get all of that information, we are best suited now to support that entrepreneur or that small business. And based on where you are in your journey, kind of, again, me stealing from the HBCU model, if you're a company that's been in business for 20 years and doing $7 million in revenue, you don't need to start at the very beginning in the Inspire stage. Mm -hmm. You probably are in the Accelerate stage. But just like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, graduate program, PhD, somebody pursuing their PhD at Harvard doesn't have to take English 101. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem with many incubators and accelerators. Mm -hmm. They kind of continuously have businesses taking English 101, and there is no progressive model to get them where they need to go. Yeah, yeah. Very good point. So we appreciate you sharing that. What do you see the future of the organization being, uh, let's say, five years from now? Well, what would be that? 
that five-year goal that you guys are trying to achieve? You know, about four weeks ago, I had some insight to it that really, uh, that really energized me a bit. Tony Ressler, the owner of the Atlanta Hawks, was walking actually with Jerome Russell from lunch back over to the Russell Center. And they encountered these two gentlemen in the parking lot. They were walking in. They struck up conversation. These two gentlemen, of course, didn't know who they were. Yeah, they were saying that they were in town from Indiana. Rod Jerome asked him or, or Tony asked him, so what brings you to, to the Russell Center? They're like, yeah, we know if we're in business, we got to start here at the Russell Center. I think, Joel, what we want to create is this epicenter of economic mobility, very collaborative. It's not where we do it on our own, where we're really being able to galvanize the best resources we have in the country to help move entrepreneurs forward. And if it's if it's data, if it's information, if it's learning, if it's connectivity, this being the epicenter of Black economic mobility in America, we own the building. We own the acreage around the building. And I think to create this space, this safe space of deep belief, of deep aspiration, but also deep execution, where literally our entrepreneurs and stakeholders believe everything is possible. And we back that up with the results to match, to show that we have companies that are growing. So in five years, I want to create north of 3,000 jobs. What would be the catalytic impact in Atlanta alone if we were able to create three to five companies that were able to do north of 50 to $150 million in revenue? That's what our scale part of the big ideas model is hoping to do, partner with Boston Consulting Group. You're talking about thousands of jobs, thousands of opportunities for people to move forward, wealth creation, uh, because part of it, brother, the thing that keeps me most motivated, although I love Atlanta, you're not going to really find many people that love the city more than I do, but we are still the worst city in the country when it comes to income inequality. Huh. We're the worst city in the country when it comes to economic mobility. A child born in a poverty in Atlanta, Georgia, has less than a 4% chance of escaping it and making it to the upper middle class. That's on our watch. Huh. And if we want to look at the geography of it, when we talk about supporting Black entrepreneurs, it's not from an emotional space. I'm a capitalist. I'm an economist. And so I'm looking at the data and saying in the city of Atlanta, we don't have any majority poor white neighborhoods, not in the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, in the APS school network, we don't have a failing Latino school. Almost 97, 98 percent of the poverty in Atlanta is Black. And so how do we move the needle economically? And if we're afraid to have a conversation about race and getting very intentional and very specific about who we support, we're missing the mark. And we're just kind of pasting over the, the things that will really make move the needle. So we're having fun building this out, brother. But really, it is about attacking those two st statistics. How do we start closing the wealth gap? And how do we start making Atlanta this economic mobility engine for all people? Yeah, wow, that's that's powerful when you really think about it, because um, you, you hate to see that disparity between the rich and the poor, you know, and even in, in Black America, you know, Atlanta is known as either the first or the second most uh, affluent city for minorities. You know, you always have, uh, I think it's Montgomery County out there around D.C., and then you also have Houston. Uh, but other than those two cities, it's Atlanta. But then again, at the same time, you're saying we have this great disparity between people who are, are not moving the needle at all or are not being able to, uh, to move things forward. So that's a, that's a big issue. Well, I appreciate you addressing that. You were going to say something else? No, but it, here's the upside of that. Uh -huh. There is no better city than Atlanta to do it. I mean, where else can you go from Ambassador Andrew Young to Andre 3000? You know, I've been spent a lot of time in Cambridge and in out on the West Coast in Silicon Valley, uh, down in Miami. I love what they're doing in Nashville and Austin, but none of them have made innovation inclusive. None of them have gotten diversity right. And I think in Atlanta, you know, we're poised because we have the corporations here. We've got the colleges here. We've got the culture. we got the community. There are more black and roll college students in Atlanta, Georgia, than any other place on the planet. Mm -hmm. We have more corporate innovation centers in Atlanta than any other city in America. Like we are starting to build this thing, this engine and shame on us. If we can't all come together, share what we know, share our resources, share our opportunities to create something that history will never forget in this city. Yeah, yeah. You know what I want to do at this point? It's a little early for when I usually do this, but I want to open up the line to uh, Q&A from our guests because this this is really, really powerful. And uh, I don't want to hog it all here. I want to allow uh, individuals to ask some questions and kind of get engaged in the conversation. But while those um, those questions and those thoughts are coming in, you know, again, you can raise your digital hand and you can put your comments 
in the uh, box there in the chat box. And first of all, tell us the website again. So if somebody wanted yeah. to learn more information, let, let's make sure we cover that. Yep, russellcenter.org, russellcenter.org. Okay, all right, so very simple to, to understand that. I want to go back to one thing you mentioned also, uh, which is a big buzz with me, is about financial education. You know, that's mm. one of the, the biggest things because for years, you know, we've seen the way minorities have historically spent money. Uh, it's on depreciating assets as opposed to appreciating assets. Owning a business, owning real estate, things like that, obviously uh, go in the right direction when it relates to building towards your future and ultimately creating the, uh, the family bank. How, how does the Russell Center help with financial education? So no matter what business you're in, you'll be able to have those tools in order to manage your money properly and move your business forward. Yeah, I mean, I think the... <sighs> You know, I was in the financial literacy space for a very long time, and I think financial literacy has very little application, let's say, if you're starving at home. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't see examples of wealth and management of wealth, it's hard to attain it. Like if we've never seen generational wealth, how can we really speak to it? If we're not wealthy, how can we really speak to 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 and teach other people about wealth? One of the things that we do very well is we partner with relatively every financial service organization of prominence in the city. You know, we have, you know, fundamental Fridays where we only talk about the concepts of raising money, deploying capital, you know, absorbing capital, but then also personal capital. What does that mean when your company goes from 200,000 in revenue to 20 million? Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you handle that? You don't know what prepared for you, prepared you for that. We've got a platform we're doing with Schwab called Mastering Your First Million. And how do you understand that and get prepared for that? Mm -hmm. But I think one of the most powerful things that we could ever do is create the kind of community that normalizes the conversation, Joel. Rather than teaching from a stage or teaching from a program, how can I create a collaborative community where those conversations happen often, where we talk about real estate opportunities, where we talk about investing, where we talk about diversifying assets, where people are introduced to concepts like a family office. Those conversations are really what I think moves the needle because collision is a part of our model. It is the one-to-one -one interaction, the trusted advisors that you build within your own social network that absolutely impact your life the most. You may hear something in a podcast or a program or a platform that absolutely makes you think differently and hopefully act differently. But if you can create communities where people are supportive and these conversations are normalized, you start to have a better chance of behavioral change. And that's where I really think we're going to move the needle because yes, somebody may pull up in a Bentley and they have before into our parking lot and think that they're, you know, their head is this big and they're, they're, this is what I'm doing. And, you know, we're always able to, God bless Mr. Russell. I remember this guy pulled up in a Benton Yaga one day, I don't know, $150,000 SUV. And he was high, you know, styling on everybody and kind of bragging about his car. I said, the young bro, well, you know, what's your net worth? He said a little over a million and a half. I said, okay. And how old are you? He says, I'm 38. I say, okay. It's a nice car you have, but put this into context. 60 years ago, five years younger than you, Mr. Russell was worth 147 times that. <laughs> Calm down. This, this is not a space. This is not a space where you have to wear it on your sleeve, where you have to show it. We've got to create this space where you don't have to be that because if you're black, a lot of times we do feel that pressure. And that's why I give grace to our community that if I went to the great school, got the great job, making great money, you know, to make my grandmama proud or my mama proud or my cousins proud, I got to drive the big car and the big house and I got to show it. And, and, you know, I can't blame us for that because they're all kind of societal pressures, communal pressures, familial pressures personal pressures that lead us down this path. But I think if we find ourselves in communities where it's not necessary, necessary or we don't feel compelled to show up in that way, we start to make better decisions. I know when I was in college, I wasn't the best student in the world. But when I got around the, around the right group of friends that had all great GPAs, you know, my GPA started to raise. Why? Not because I got smarter, mm -hmm. but my circle changed, my thinking changed. Uh, my community changed. And we hope to do that same thing when we start talking about financial education, but also financial application and execution. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually huge. You know, we had um, uh, Herman Bulls, who's the uh, chairman of, vice chairman of JLL for the uh, Americas. 
he brought up a, a good point about hanging out with eagles, you know, as opposed to just hanging out with pigeons, right? And that's really what it boils down to, you know, your association. Talk to me also about your your hoodie there. there there's a reason you got that on. And I see that well, you know top, what? at the top it says wealth. So what, what is what is Well, that it mean? says wealth lives here, Russell okay. Center. Okay. But it's one of the things I'm most proud of, man. I mean, I think that we're very intentional about the way we spend our money. Over the past three years, we spent north of $8 million with the companies that we support. So if you come to the Russell Center, everything from the toilets being installed, paint on the wall, architect, artist, uh, products, the water that we drink, low voltage, AV is all by do done by companies that we support. Hmm. You know, we've spent more money with black companies than some Fortune 1000 companies. And so it's 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 walking the talk. And this T-shirt is made by one of our stakeholders, Tony Kruver of Kruvy, of Kruver, Kruvy Clothing Company. Mm -hmm. And most of the clothes I wear, brother, may or produce or sold by one of the companies we support. It's a deep level of intentionality in how we spend our dollar and how we elevate these companies. Yeah, yeah, that's the true Black Wall Street. That yeah, circulating dollars. Yeah, exactly. Indeed. Very, very powerful. T. Redwine, I apologize. I forgot your first name from the last time you were here, but um, you asked a question here. At what minimum stage should program applicants be in their business endeavors to apply and ultimately be accepted? So how would you answer that, Jay? Yeah, to, you know, our model allows for somebody that's just in the curiosity stage. They may have an idea, but they have no idea how to execute. So inspire, develop, execute, accelerate, scale, allow someone that's in the very beginning of their, their concept all the way to a company that's trying to do look at a growth stage and look from going from 5 million to 10 million. And so those, again, I'll reiterate to take it from the call. If you think back to a college education and we're not a college, we don't work with college students or kids per se. It's just about people that are in business. Now, if they happen to be in college, certainly. But this is about business people. But, you know, a freshman is not going to take Ph.D. level coursework. And a PhD student is not going to take freshman English. And so we create we've created a space that allows for both within one center. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, hopefully, so any uh, stage is the short answer to that the question. OK. All right. So, Ms. Redwine, if that answers your question, hope we're good. Absolutely. Thank you. OK. All right. Fantastic. Uh, Janet, you wanted to ask, with all the African-American wealth and successful people in Atlanta, why are we absent in the real estate space? We do not own a significant amount of land in this city. Why is this? OK. Oh, wow. I mean, okay, we don't own a significant true. amount of land anywhere. Black yeah, people, true. <laughs> although we, we created the agrarian economy, we own less than 2% of the dirt in America. Less than 2%. And if you're talking about arable land where you can grow something or produce something, less than 1%. You know, it's one of the things that actually led me to looking at the Russell Center as an opportunity and making my decision because I, I hate being in the black Mecca. And I look at the skyline, I don't see any of the buildings that are owned, controlled by people who look like me. It is one of those things that we hope to do if we're able to grow businesses of significant size, the businesses that can do 50, 100, 200, 300 million dollars in, in revenue. What would be the catalytic impact of five, seven, eight of those companies in Atlanta with intentionality? We could start to see that landscape change, but we also got to think of a generational thing as well. Our wealth is pretty thin as far as layers. I mean, outside of the Russell family and maybe one or two others, they're not a whole lot of generationally wealthy families. If you have money, for the most part, your first generation money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to be able to take the risk, to be able to, you know, handle the carry, to be able to bring the cash to the table. You know, the truth is when you start talking about statistics, myth versus reality, 71% of black people in Atlanta are what's considered liquid asset poor. If we had a $2,000 emergency, we could not satisfy it with our own resources. That means the new poverty in a shack on the West side, the new poverty is literally a five bedroom brick house, two cars in the garage, but you don't have 2000 in the bank. And the honest answer is this, guys, if you took the one wealthiest black I mean, wealthiest white family in Atlanta, probably the Cox family, and we added up every single black person's every possession, every pair of shoes, every 401k, every level of salary they'll earn for the rest of their lives. Tyler Perry, T.I., the Russells and all included put us all in one bucket. The Cox family could cut a check and buy out every black person in the region and still be wealthy. 
We've got a long way, but people don't really get the construct of this wealth gap that exists. It's a real, real thing. And so it's a problem that we have to solve collectively. But I think it's also one of those generational things that will evolve because we got to remember 50 years ago in Atlanta, it was damn near illegal for a black person to even own a building in the city. So that they yeah, Ricky, you say it, the 400 year head start on top of a number of other things. It's uh, there are a lot of things that go into that. But I think being aware of it for those of us that have the ability to impact change back to Joel, what I said earlier, uh-huh. I got to see somebody take down a building, own a building, be inspired by it for me to be 23 and aspire to own a building. Right. Because I've seen it done. I believe it can be done. And maybe I could even contact the person that did it. Those are the type of of like generational curse breakers and exposure that we can create in this city. That's why I talk about Mr. Russell's legacy so often whenever I get a chance, because not enough people know that people that look like them did it at that level. So, you know, whoever asked the question, Janet, it's true. Hey, Janet, it's true. But I think that 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 uh, that we're making some ground. uh, But we got a lot of work to do in this space for sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Appreciate that. You know, I wanted to add on to that because, um, you know, for me, I I grew up in Manhattan and it always struck me how you have 125th Street with the Apollo Theater is one train stop from 57th Street and Billion. Yes, sir. One train stop, (laughs) right? And yet and still so many Blacks at 125th Street feel that there's no way they can live one train stop away. Isn't that possible? You know, it's it's a really amazing thing. And oftentimes it's because, like you said, there's nobody that looks like them that has done that before. And so they just think that it's, it's impossible from that standpoint. So it's a, it's a very powerful thing. The other thing I wanted to mention, which was really interesting to me as, as I studied financial literacy and, and became more adept for myself, was the idea of how the Rockefellers built the family bank. Mm. And you brought up a very powerful point about us being first generational but how do we make sure that that transitions? I had even asked Jerome about that. You know, how do we transition to make sure the next generation picks up on that that level and continues to go forward as well, as opposed to dropping the ball and all the wealth going away? And one of the things that I found that the Rockefellers had done was, in addition to only real estate and everything else, they put so many things in trust so that they control the asset but didn't have the personal liability. And then they also had insurance because the two things that generally can create wealth is insurance. And real estate, and obviously a business like you're talking about here. And if you're able to put those in the right mechanisms, the right financial instrument, then when things happen to a family member dies off, all that cash is then now available to fund the next business going forward or the next acquisition of real estate. And it starts to compound itself. You know, those are just simple principles that oftentimes we just don't know about, you know. And they think, like you said, the idea is to buy a fancy car, but I mean, you know, as well as I do, that thing is losing money. It's not giving you no greater appreciative value from that standpoint. So tell me, appreciate you bringing that out. Oh, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Let me uh, go to, um, I think Adrian was next. Let me grab her question. Do participants graduate from the program or does the partnership remain in place as long as the participant is in business? That's actually a question I was going to ask as well. Um, Is there a a spinoff point? If so, what does that look like? How, How would you answer that? You know, I mean, we, we're, we're a startup, too. And so we've only been at this three and a half years. Two of those years were a pandemic globally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of those years, we just sat in a glo- gutted out building. The building was completely gutted out. And we had to start from zero. So for us to make as much progress as we have, you know, I'm really proud of that. But then, too, this is a model that we're testing. It takes time to cycle through a model to really see if it works. I would hope that people don't graduate. Similar to rich white guys never stop paying their dues at their country club. Why? Because they always want to be in the mix of part of that community, learning, giving back, making deals, cutting deals and everything else. There's value in that community. And therefore, on an annual basis to the day that they die, back to your point, Joel, in many cases, if I'm a member of Augusta, I can pass down that pot potential mm-hmm. membership to a, a child yeah. or my wife or future generations because the value of that community is so strong. Mm-hmm. I want to do the same with the Russell Center. 
I see so much value in a company that's going through the scale phase of what we're doing, being able to mentor someone in the idea phase in the very beginning of their journey for them to see and have a direct line side access to people that are doing it at the next level. Joel, to your point, if 125th to 127th, that right next block over, two blocks over, if there was some way that I could really see, touch and feel those people over there, it may not seem so foreign to you. And so, you know, in our in our theory of change, people don't graduate. I think the growth scale for any business, businesses are always trying to grow, become more efficient, increase revenues, become more profitable. That's a lifelong journey for a business. Well, we want to create a platform that is always providing support for that business throughout their lifespan. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful. Because I know some incubator programs, um, you know, they basically spin you off maybe at a sale or maybe once you graduate to a certain level. But that is actually a very, very powerful point. So you're really expanding on the, the community model. Like you never, you might graduate from Morehouse, but you're always still a Morehouse alumni. Always. <laughs> you can always tap into that network. You can always go back to campus and lecture. You're probably a member of the Alumni Association. You stay engaged with your classmates and people that you grew up with. You may take on a mentee that's a Morehouse student. You give back you know, philanthropically to the school. All of this is part of that community, and you're always going to be a Morehouse man yeah. or a Spelman woman or a Georgia Bulldog or whatever else it is. It's, again, we've got many examples of these communities that are evergreen. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, multi-generational, the support, the Rockefellers and all of these other families, because make no mistake, the wealthiest folks that we know all kind of generated it through some idea, some business, some concept, mm-hmm. you know, like the Walton kids. Yeah, they inherited that wealth from an entrepreneur Yeah, in Atlanta. If it's if it's Arthur Blank, if it's if it's whoever you want to name of great wealth, Bernie Marcus or whoever the head Tyler Perry. All of it is ideation executed at a very high level to create yeah. wealth for generations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, grab Glenn Gray. What's up, Glenn? How you doing this morning? Hey, Joe. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Again, another amazing guest. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share. Sure. Jay, I had a you know question for you and a statement. I was fortunate a couple of years ago to be in Atlanta, and you had a luncheon, and you led a tour. There were a lot of powerful things that happened that day. I mean, you know, Brother Kimbo spoke, but really two things that stood out. A, you shared and you showed us the actual bricks that uh, Mr. Russell laid with his hands in the building that you were going to you know, turn into this concept. The second thing was you talked about having banks literally with an office in that building with the intention and the dedication to finance the you know, the businesses that were in the incubation program. The third thing actually was, and it's been lingering with me because you mentioned that you're building this on a concept that I did not know exists. This Motown model where, you know, the way Motown was basically was a cycle of of development opportunities in a supply chain, basically, but an intentional one, had no idea that, you know, that's really what was going on. And I always wanted to come back to you and ask, A, did you apply that model and how is it going? Like, do you have a case study where someone has went through that cycle and maybe had to go back to, quote unquote, wardrobe, you know, to fix something that wasn't working and then move back to the stage performance, which was an analogy, an example that you shared. Could you go deeper a little bit more on that? Oh, Glenn, so you're going old school with us, man. I appreciate that. So, so Joel, Glenn can attest when Dr. Kimbrough, who's part of our faculty, we did that tour. We didn't have even a room to, to host Dr. Kimbrough. We did it across the street at Pascal's because when Glenn toured the building, it was a gutted out facility. <laughs> and so that's how far. And Glenn, I'm assuming that was about three, three and a half years ago. So it wasn't a long Correct. time. And so, yes. We are we're continue to, continuing to build out of that. That model, Big Ideas, was kind of born from that concept, Glenn, of building that. For everybody on the call, I tell a story about Barry Gordy and, and the inspiration I took from Mo- Mo- Motown when I took a tour. Because I watched the Motown movie. I watched the Temptations movie a thousand times. I love Detroit. I took a business trip to Detroit. I uh, got to pay for the extra VIP tour. 
and they gave us the whole game. But I thought it was that little white building uh, that was Hitsville, USA. And that's where all the things were done. All the magic was made. I was wrong. At the height of his career, Barry Gordy, back to, to who asked the question about real estate? I think it was Allison. But Barry Gordy bought the whole street. And I don't care if you were the next Diana Ross, when you walked up to that building saying, hey, I'm the next Smokey Robinson. They were like, oh, OK, cool. Go back out that door, make a right, go to the end of the street, the house one. And literally every artist, every as aspiring artist would go from voice lessons to stage presence to media training. They would go through this rubric. And unless you made it through that rubric, you never got it, were able to cut an album. And if you got in there into the studio or got in there into a showcase and you couldn't dance, you couldn't breathe, voice was off pitch, they knew how to course correct immediately because they would call down to house four, you know, house four, how did you get Glenn up here and he can't breathe? We're sending them back and send them back to house four because immediately we could course correct the thing that you didn't have to raise that competency that you lack. Glenn, we've not fully cycled anybody through it yet. We're in the middle of it. So I think our case study is probably three years out. Once we've fully done and fully realized the cycle of this big ideas platform, but it is absolutely how we built the platform to look at competencies and not just time in education. That's the other piece, Joel, when I start talking about freshman, sophomore, junior, uh -huh. we know in college, if you can't pass English 101, you don't become a sophomore. And that's for your benefit, right. because how can I move you along this continuum and you don't know have the basic constructs? You're going to fail in the sophomore year. So we have the same thing where we have rubrics, we call them, uh, what do they call uh, gauntlets that everybody has to go through before they go from stage to stage to prove that you have the demonstrated acumen, the mastery, the competencies needed to move to the next level, or you don't move, you stay in that space. That's why some of us were five-year seniors, because we needed to stay around a little bit more longer before we graduated. Uh, but then the last thing, Glenn, when you come next time, we've created a capital corridor, about 7,500 square feet that we've allocated where we've got Invest Atlanta. We've got the Metro Atlanta Chamber. We've got two Black-owned VCs. We've got the Greenlight Fund. We've got the Metro Atlanta Black Chambers. And banks, no one can domicile there, but they spend time doing tours within the bank because we want to make sure that our entrepreneurs have all access to capital, whatever that means, best source of capital, best learning, best education. We won't be able to end institutional bias, but I can close the education gap and the preparation gap. I can make sure you know the best source of capital, how much you really need, how to absorb it, how to deploy it, how to make it grow, how to create a growth strategy with your company because you received the capital. But then also I can make sure that if you're going after a line of credit with uh, Chase Bank, that we know all 15 of their things under their underwriting criteria. And before I introduce you to Chase Bank, you have all 15. There's no ambiguity. Chase loves us now because we're sending them ready customers. That they don't have to do much work to. We understand when we place the call to Chase, they pick it up because they know the person we're sending is fully prepared to go through their underwriting process because we send them if they are, we don't send them if they are not. That part starts to erode that gap, Joel, around like the disparity around who gets funding and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's that preparation and education and that support even after the dollars are administered that we hope will move the needle a bit. So Glenn, we're working, bro. Whenever you're back in Atlanta, let's uh, let's take another tour and refresh that visit. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Man, it's, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate that. <clears throat> you know, we always appreciate your support. This, is, this has been a, extremely powerful. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I've even learned some things. Uh, as to what, you know, you guys were doing down there. And it's exciting. You know, it's one of those things where people always talk about why we don't have more Black businesses, why we don't have this, why we don't have that. And instead of just talking about it, you're actually doing it, you know, putting the work where somebody can point the finger and say, yeah, it's happening right there. They're doing it. Go talk to them and they'll show you how it's getting done. So it's, it's very powerful what you guys are doing. I really appreciate it. Uh, let me ask this. Is there an age, uh, a minimum age? Is there probably not a maximum age, but you know, <laughs> is there a minimum age for um, young ones that might want to get involved or younger ones? Not really. We have, you know, one of my mentees, uh, this guy named Mason. He's the youngest restaurant owner in the state of Georgia. And he's 14 years old now. Oh, wow. But okay. <laughs> yeah, he has a hot dog stand in the city of Stonecrest and he's killing the game. He's about to build a food truck and he's 14 years old. He's got seven employees. He's incredible. But that's the anomaly. But I think, Joel, one of the things that I, I hope to do while I'm in tenure at the Russell Center 
is I'm a firm. I want to create the AAU for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think if we put the same amount of effort into finding the next H.J. Russell as we did the next LeBron James, we move the needle because we know if you can catch a ball, run a ball, shoot a ball, kick a ball. I don't care what small corner of the world you live in. They will find you. Yeah. They will cultivate that talent, nurture that talent, train that talent in hopes of finding the next NBA or NFL superstar. Well, I think for every one LeBron James, there are a thousand great entrepreneurs. Yeah, you took the words and, out of my mouth, man. I was just about to go there. Go ahead, please continue. Yeah, and if we can create this farm league, like the thing about you know financial literacy courses and training is I'll go into a classroom with 30 kids, and yeah, I may be talking about financial literacy or entrepreneurship, but out of that 30 kids, maybe only two really have the stuff to be real entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Well, they get the same education as everybody else. When I leave, I'm gone and that's it. Well, that's why the AAU exists. I may live in South Georgia and the competition isn't so strong in my division. But if I'm a standout player, the AAU league allows me to play with people at or way above my level. So I got to grow my game. It's the best of the best coming together to compete, to really Iron sharpens iron. Yeah. Well, what if I could take those kids from, from one program and other programs in this school and bring them into a center where they're starting to learn together? These are these assassin squads of young entrepreneurs that are always connected to older entrepreneurs doing it at the next level and curriculum and access. Now we start seeing people at that age where they're growing up in this space of possibility, where they're growing up in this space that I can own my own business. I don't have to be 73 to be rich. I can do it at 21 because that guy right there did it. Or I learned about that guy that did it at 18. It's normalized. Mm -hmm. And so there is no written age limit or requirement, mm -hmm. but we scale like our average age of stakeholder company we have is about a stakeholder founder or owner or CEO is about 41, 42. But I hope, Joel, that we evolve into a space back to that continuum that reaches all the way back to K-12 through college and then into adulthood. If we if we really make this thing sing, we'll be able to impact those three levels for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really powerful when you think about it. So it's uh, it's quite an example. It's quite a model. I'm, I'm extremely happy and proud to uh, to see what's happening. You know, I, I think about just uh, all the, the VCs and different firms, you know, obviously we're in the the capital raising business, you know, syndicating debt and equity in, in so many ways. And it's rare you see minorities that are in those positions or making those decisions to get that capital out. But when you're running a business like this, you are in that decision to, to give back, like the Russell family has done, giving back and, and sponsoring others and uh, setting the example. So it's a, it's a very, very beautiful thing. You know, we appreciate you guys doing it. So we're down to about, you know, our final 10 minutes. What would you say? Uh, to anyone who wants to get involved or what would you want the, the next generation to know? As uh, let's say they're not in their, their 40s, you kind of gave us a little bit about that, but um, what concluding comments would you have for us? Yeah, I mean, it's easy to find us at russellcenter.org. I use LinkedIn kind of like my quasi inbox. So if we're not connected on LinkedIn, just find me, Jay Bailey, as it says in the little corner, J-A-Y Bailey. Would love to connect if we want to talk further, if you weren't able to ask your question. You know, Joel, we spoke about it. We want to be this safe space for ideas to blossom, mm -hmm. where a lot of times if you're a black entrepreneur, if you're a black professional, if you're a black executive, we've heard the mantra, you got to be twice as sharp, twice as smart, twice as put together, twice as on point. That gets heavy. And oftentimes if we're wearing that mask or wearing that armor to be twice as everything, we never allow ourselves to be vulnerable enough to really learn or to build the kind of relationships that are necessary to move forward. Uh -huh. So it's a really tough thing. You know, I got two pieces of advice from two icons that I hold very dearly that I'll leave with. One was Ambassador Andrew Young, who told me, son, you better make your friends before you need them. Uh -huh. um, really holding on to this notion of you don't know where people are going. You don't know how somebody can help you along the way but build authentic relationships now while you have the opportunity because you never know where they'll benefit you later. I've seen that happen dozens, if not hundreds of times in my life where people that I invest in early on never stood still and they end up becoming mayors of cities or governors of states or senior executives 
at Fortune 100 corporations and our relationship was cemented 10 years ago when we didn't necessarily need anything from each other and we weren't looking at someone's position or their possessions, just a person. Right. Uh, relationships mattering. The second was C.T. Vivian. And you spoke to it a little earlier, Joel. I had the opportunity to sit with him multiple times. Well, one of the times I asked him, Doc, you know, you guys were some kids. You were early 20s, late mid 20s, early 30s. And you guys changed the world without firing a single shot. How'd you do it? He said, Doc, all the power is in the doing. It is in the action that things are changed. And, and as he continued to mentor me, this thing about, as you said, Joel, we have a lot of pontification, a lot of talk about change that needs to happen. What needs to do here? Why don't we have this? And he told me, man, while everybody else was talking about how we can change the world and change society, we were out there trying. Uh -huh. We didn't get it all right. We certainly made mistakes, but we were out there doing while everybody else was talking. You don't have to open the Russell Center to change the world. You just got to focus on the three feet around you. Uh, how can you impact those things that you can impact? How can you, you know, find problems that you can do something about and do something? But most importantly, my personal model, how do you continue to plant seeds that will grow trees whose shade you may never sit under? What are you doing in this life right now that will be relevant seven generations from now? And I think all of us have the power to do that. It's just committing to change. Yeah, yeah. One of the areas to start doing that is with your own family and your own kids. You know, help them. Absolutely, brother. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that is that is that kind of incremental change that really changes the world. Mm -hmm. That one kid could create the new Amazon that hires 150,000 people because he felt or she felt nurtured and loved and supported and was exposed to opportunities. Yeah. It could start with that one kid. That's right. So be a father to your kids, right? Come on, man. <laughs> Absolutely. So we appreciate you, you being here. And um, as always, this is the uh, Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. Thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to seeing you next week as well. All right. Take care, everyone. You've been listening to Mornings with Joel commercial real estate podcast, where we focus on rising stars and established players in commercial real estate and talk to them about how they are building legacies in today's marketplace. Please check back weekly to hear our upcoming guests.